Grace and Peace Kingstown Communion. What a privilege it is to be asked by your pastor, Michelle, to come and share a few words with you today. My name is Cameron Wilds, and I'm the new pastor at Rising Hope Mission Church in Alexandria. We bring you greetings from our friends along the Route 1 corridor. I look forward to finding ways to partner with all of you in the future. Let's be honest, COVID-19 really sucks in a lot of ways, but it has also been a blessing in many others as well. For instance, I love on Sunday mornings being able to worship with all of you, something I wasn't able to do prior to this pandemic. Reverend Michelle has been working through the prophets with you all, and she said she just had finished, but... If it's okay, I I want to stick with it for just one more week while throwing in some thoughts from the Apostle Paul as well. But before we jump into the prophets, let's stick with the theme of Facebook, if you will, and getting lost in live feeds. I was mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, passing time one day while waiting for my wife to come home from work. It was one of those moments where you intend to waste, you know, maybe five, ten minutes, but then you find yourself 20, 30 minutes later caught up in a live Facebook stream from some random person doing some random thing like opening oysters to reveal the pearl that's inside. Only on this particular occasion, it wasn't oysters. I was watching a potter spinning bowls and and cups. I, I watched him as he pulled out a lump of clay He cut it down to the proper portion. He he plopped the clay on a wheel and then tossed a little water on it, and he began to spin it with his foot. As he kicked the wheel, the clay began to spin rapidly while his hands gently and eloquently worked the clay into the shape of a vessel. I was mesmerized at what was taking shape before my eyes. I had been there from the very beginning with him. I saw the clay pulled from the larger pile of mud. I knew what it looked like before, and I could see what it was becoming. I was invested. I was so invested that I went on Amazon to see about a potter's wheel for my own home, like like I was going to start spinning my own pottery. At this point, it didn't matter if my wife, Samantha, came home. I knew I wasn't leaving the screen until he finished the piece. And then, friends, it happened. Just like the hero who dies at the end of the story, just as I thought the chalice he was making was nearly complete, he did the unthinkable thing. He added some water to his hands, and he pressed down into the center of the clay chalice. And just like that, it turned back to clay. The clay lump that it was at the beginning. I was devastated. Why would he do such a thing? It wasn't that bad. He smashed it because to the potter's eye, it wasn't quite right. The Jeremiah passage from today was a a passage in which Jeremiah was caught up in a similar scene. Although he didn't view the potter from the screen of a phone. Jeremiah, shortly before the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians, has been summoned by God to go to the local potter's house because God was going to instruct the prophet through a hands-on parable concerning the fate of God's people. Jeremiah witnesses the potter fashioning a piece of pottery, and just like the potter who seemingly wasted 20 minutes of my life by smashing his chalice, Jeremiah witnessed the potter do the same to his. Now the question is, what does this mean? Well, luckily God fills Jeremiah in concerning what he had just witnessed. God is the potter, the creative mind, the the one who shapes and creates a beautiful piece of art. The clay? The clay is Israel, the people of God, being formed and shaped alongside their creator. Yet as God is shaping the people of Israel, there comes a point in time where Israel doesn't seem to be coming out the way God had envisioned. It's not just right. 
There are blemishes and imperfections that, that need to be addressed. To use the imagery of the potter, the piece cannot go on the way that it's currently taking shape. Just as the potter must start over with the blemished clay, so too must God start over with the not quite right people of Israel. But notice, neither the potter nor God throw the clay away. It isn't destroyed. It must simply undergo the process of being remade. And if we're honest with the scriptures, we would notice that this episode in Jeremiah's prophecy is it the first time, and definitely won't be the last time, that God and the Israelites find themselves in need of remolding or reshaping their relationship together? The story of Israel needing to be reshaped by God is the thread that runs through the whole course of their history together. God, the compassionate potter, has a grand plan, if you will, for God's people, and yet they constantly choose their own way. Instead, in the case from today's lesson, the people have given themselves over to the worship of idols. They have fallen away from the path of their ancestors before them. They have left the highway of God and taken the detours down the deathly side streets. In short, as God says to Jeremiah, they have forgotten me. The clay no longer recognizes the hands of the potter. Therefore, the potter has but one choice— let the people reap the consequences of their labor. And we know these types of people, do we not? That those people who are hell-bent on doing things their own way, even at the expense of themselves. People committed to the propagation of sin and violence in our world. The Bible has a name for these types of people. It calls them the unrighteous or the ungodly. They are the types that don't seem to ever get it right. They are the blemished and the cracked. They are the ones needing to be crushed and remolded. And not only do they need it, most of the time they deserve it. They are the ones standing in the line of the wrath of God. They are easy to give a face to. Who are the ungodly? We know who they are. Folks like Hitler and Pol Pot, those are easy. Certainly these are ungodly. People who commit atrocities like mass shootings, these people are ungodly people. Those who promote the isms of our world like racism, sexism, classism, these people are ungodly people. It's not hard for us to imagine the fate of such ungodly individuals. And not only do we imagine their fate, we yearn for them to hear the words of Jeremiah's prophecy that the potter is shaping evil against them and devising a plan to destroy them. But the real challenge of today's reading is the internal plight that occurs when the they we see becomes the we of our lives. What about the ordinary ungodly? Does God draw a distinction between righteous and unrighteous, godly and ungodly? How are we to know which side of that line, if there is one, we ourselves are on? The Apostle Paul in the New Testament seems to make it clear from his reading of the Hebrew Bible that the ungodly is a quite inclusive set of people. As he writes in Romans, reflecting on Psalm 14, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, together they have all gone wrong. No one does good, not even one. In short, the Christian witness is one in which none of us can read Jeremiah's passage and come to the conclusion that the word against them is not also a swift indictment upon us. It's not just Israel who stands in the crosshairs of God's wrath, but we do. It's not just Israel who stands in the need of being reshaped, but we do. It's not just they, as much as we want it to be, but it's also we. You see, I'm convinced until this central reality of ourselves is grasped, we will continue to point to the ungodly other in our midst without the recognition of ourselves. Article 9 of the Article of Religion, a document our tradition holds as essential to our faith, makes it as plain as it can be when it says original sin stands not in the following of Adam, but it is the fault and corruption of the nature of every human being. 
whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness and is of his own nature inclined to evil. And therefore, in every person born into this world, they deserve God's wrath and damnation. Who are the ungodly? According to Scripture, we are. Who stands with Israel and the lust after their own plans? According to Scripture, we do. Who needs to be made right? We do. And yet the gospel message is that it may take God's own suffering to bring about our redoing. The cross, the symbol of our faith, is a strange kind of wrath, is it not? It's the wrath that acknowledges that the wages of our sin is death, to be sure. And yet in the same breath, Paul reminds us that at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since now we have been justified by his blood, by our own actions, absolutely not. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The message that culminates the gospel is that the God whose wrath is directed towards us because of our own unrighteousness has turned the anger toward himself, taking our unrighteousness and granting us his righteousness in place. No longer do we hold on to the need to be made righteous by and through our own abilities, our own incessant desires to get it right. The crucifixion and resurrection call us to simply trust that everything that needed to be done for us has been done and given to us as a gift. God has become the fashioned clay in Christ, crushed for our iniquities, and has offered his work back to us, to which we simply say, now. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power, that power to make right what has been made wrong, belongs to God and does not come from us. This is something to be thankful for. I offer this to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, we give thanks for all with which you have blessed us even until this day. We give thanks for the people who call themselves Kingstown Communion and for the witness that they give to their community. We give thanks for their staff and leadership team. We give thanks for their pastor, Michelle. God, we give you thanks for always being the potter who does not discard the clay, but simply reshapes it and remolds it over and over and over again. You have given us grace upon grace, gifts by which we could only say thank you. In this world in which we live, O oh God, we ask that you would continue to be with those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. We ask, O oh God, that you would continue to be with those who are the meek and the mild of our society. Those who feel they have no hope. Those who feel voiceless. In the middle of our world right now, O oh God, we ask that you would rise up peacemakers. And that, that they would not only inherit your kingdom, but that they would help to bring about your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Bless those who mourn. Bless those who seek justice.
We ask, O oh God, that you would continue to be with us and these people. As we pray to you the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.